Well, John, thanks again for joining us. Sure. Um, and we thought we could begin by asking you to just recap the sort of scene at Apple in 1985 um, that immediately preceded you know, the work that would lead to the desktop publishing business at Apple. If you could take us back there and okay. uh, what was going on for Apple with business, the business sales and software and the laser writer and, and where you sat. Do you want to start with the date and the... We can. <laughs> it's August 10th, 2017. It's David Brock and Hanson Sue with John Skull. Um, so yeah, if you could take us back into that picture. Yeah, so at the beginning of 1985, uh, that would have been when we uh, officially introduced um, the Mac Office, was the way we were presenting the combination of the Macintosh and the new Laser Writer printer. And so that got launched, I believe, January. You know, we typically back then were introducing things uh, in, in January because we had done it you know, the year before is when we had introduced the Macintosh in January 84. And so uh, it was introduced um, with a fair amount of fanfare. You know, it, we were very hopeful, uh, you know, as, as a company, you know, as the Mac division, which I was a part of. Um, and it did not really do that well. Um, it was accompanied you know, launched previous, you know, they had done the Lemmings, what was the, f the famous kind of follow-on to the 1984 ad, it was called Lemmings. Uh, it did not do very well. <laughs> um, the Mac office itself really didn't kind of deliver on the promise because we were pretty light on software. It, uh, the laser writer uh, was es essentially viewed by many people as just an expensive shared printer because we really didn't have any unique things to take advantage of it at that point. There were minimal graphics uh, products. The whole notion of desktop publishing didn't exist. There, there was one product that was sort of available um, called Mac Publisher, um, but it wasn't, it wasn't a WYSIWYG editor. Hmm. Um, and it you know, had some bugs. It was, it, it was an early version, let's say. But the, the bottom line is, is the whole positioning was this was going to go into mainstream office, you know, to, to go compete against, you know, Microsoft and IBM in the mainstream office. But we didn't have the software really to, to do it and the cost structure. So uh, that was basically was the launch of kind of that, that springtime of 1985. Um, you know, the Mac sales were not doing great. There was just a lot of pressure on the company, a lot of pressure on the Mac division, a lot of pressure on Steve. Um, it led to a lot of turmoil. So there's a lot of turmoil kind of politically inside the company because, that, it, let's face it, the, the Mac just wasn't doing that great. <laughs> and the Laser Rider was not any savior. It right. had gone from, if my numbers are correct, you know, February when we first pushed the product into the market, you know, we, you know, sold like 2,000 units and it went from like 2,000 units to 1,600 units the next month to 1,200 units the next month to 800 units the next month to, to 400 units the next month. And that was basically the first, the first few months. So it clearly wasn't selling through the channel. And so, you know, it was really a crisis. The, everything kind of culminated with, you know, the famous, uh, you know, Steve being removed as the head of the Mac division, the Mac division getting blown up. He ultimately, you know, left, um, you know, the, the company. Um, and basically all the product divisions at Apple, uh, which there was, if I'm not, there was the Apple II, there's the, the Mac division, and there's the peripherals division. I'm not sure if we had another division or not, but the, the main product divisions all got, got you know, um, got eliminated. And instead, we went to a one product group, uh, and we had functional areas in, in marketing and sales, which was, you know, consumer, education, and business. Right. And so... Um, Many people left the Mac, you know, from, you know, there was a time when, you know, people were left. I was asked to join the Mac and to join the business unit um, on the marketing side. And my task was to figure out how to, you know, kind of get the, get the laser writer, you know, going. Um, and so 
you know, at that, that point, it was probably May or June, you know, right around then when, when that all happened, um, is myself and a summer intern, quite frankly, that had, that had joined me to do something else. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, we, you know, kind of quickly, you know, it was my responsibility to kind of figure it out. And so I did what I thought was the right thing to do was to go get smart on stuff as fast as I could. And so, you know, I, I believe software drives everything in, in the personal computer world, mm. and that's the key to it. So the first thing I did is went and talked to anybody that was doing anything interesting, uniquely taking advantage of the laser rider. And so that led to a lot of discussions with, with the graphics people and this new category of, of software that became known later as desktop publishing, but as page layout. Uh -huh. You know, is, is how it was described because everybody had a different view on what to call it. Uh, publishing kind of got in there, um, but but essentially looked at that, and then we went through a fairly quick. You, you know, Apple was in a crisis. Um, sales were terrible. Um, you know, our stock price, ev everything. It was just a crisis, right? Anytime you have such a disruptive thing as that was both an, uh, a crisis, but also out of crisis, normally there's opportunity. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of saw very quickly after talking to a few folks, and this is, you know, folks like Jonathan Siebold that had a, a perspective, the guys at Adobe who were obviously instrumental to, <coughs> to the laser writer and PostScript, guys like Paul Brainerd, uh, the folks at Manhattan Graphic, I believe it's Ken Abbott's the name, um, you know, and then there are some other people that were in the area, and obviously our evangelism group, um, and to just find out what was going on. And so, you know, very quickly saw that there looked like there was this really compelling new use case, but, you know, didn't quite know for sure that it was going to be a big thing, because it seemed like it might just be a niche. Right, nothing wrong with the niche, but it seemed like it might not be the big enough to be something that Apple ought to get behind. So I, um, by luck, uh, Stanford uh, has a publishing uh, class, or at least they did that summer, and they had people from the publishing industry, and this was not just from the traditional, but from smaller and graphic arts. They all came to learn you know, and, and do this, this special class. I think it was like a six week long class, if right. I'm not mistaken. And so we knew the people there. And so I got connected to the head of it and said, would you guys like to come to our campus and we're gonna, you know, we're gonna sh demonstrate this new, new functionality that we think might be really compelling. So we brought, uh, I don't, I forget exactly, I think it was about 40 people they came, we did a presentation and a demo of the laser rider, uh, and, and I got guys from uh, Adobe to give us some materials, and we basically presented PageMaker, you know, the Aldous product, and some really interesting things about fonts, and showed them how you could do page layout on a computer and then print it instantly onto a laser printer, and people were just blown away, you know. I just want to zoom in on that a little yeah. bit, and was the opportunity, that you were seeing that you didn't know, you know, maybe it's a niche, maybe bigger. Was this to be for people in uh, graphic design, publishing of all kinds to do, in essence, like rapid prototyping? So that's to say like, you know, working out a design or a page layout or something like that as, as just that, as prototyping before they would go into whatever the big, right. more laborious process was of uh, printing. Uh, possibly, uh, at that point, to be honest, I wasn't sure. I okay. had spent, you know, in my first two years at Apple, one of the years as I was the head of, of Marcom, for, as the Marcom manager for the Mac division, which right. means I got to spend a lot of time with advertising, our creative services group, you know, in the PR group. So I spent a lot of time, and so, it's, so I had some relationships in our creative services, which are our in-house group that does a lot of the materials. And so obviously they were a key input that I went to and said, what do you think about this, oh. right? And they were already, had been using and were familiar with the laser writer, obviously, because they'd been doing work to support the Mac office launch and all the collateral. And so that was a very helpful 
and as we brought in this other group, we were sh trying to figure out you know, just where it would be. Is this something that was just going to be for kind of prototyping and concepts, or is it actually going to be for final product? Right. You know, and what we found when we talked to a, a, a variety, and I did this all, we did this all in like six weeks. <laughs> okay. I mean, this is because, because we knew, I mean, I knew that, you know, this is the summer. The way Apple worked is any major program that if we were going to, since we are at that point, very dealer and retail focused company. Right, we sold only through dealers. Um, we had to have a program in place by September at the very latest, or else we we're going to miss the rest of the year. Mm -hmm. So, if we're going to introduce any new training, any new uh, any new uh, program for our retails or our retailers, we had to do it really fast. We had, by the end of August, we had to be done. <laughs> right. So, so, and this is like June one. You know, so that's three months to figure out what we're going to do and then do something. And so, and I figured it was kind of either now or we we're basically going to lose a major season, mm -hmm. right? And given the crisis, given the opportunity and kind of my personality, I'm not one to kind of sit around, we did that. And so, um, did a quick, quick and dirty, you know, analysis of how people react. And that was like, wow, you could just see that they really bought it, that this was very, very compelling. And the more I understood about it, you could see how the way you did things traditionally, you know, the cut and paste way that people were producing brochures or newsletters or things like that, this could just transform that. So at least at the, at the lower level, maybe not the high end, you know, book publishing and magazine publishing right. or newspaper publishing, but, but a large swath of, of publishing material, this was going to be a really good fit for. And so once we kind of instinctively felt that and you know you get that from talking to people that are really smart then we kind of did a quick okay now we got to come up with materials to help our salespeople you know find those kind of customers for our marketing materials and advertising and PR to target those kind of people so then we started to work with and put together a marketing plan and then that culminated with launching in I think we officially launched in October at least from a public standpoint, you know, Apple's desktop publishing. But we put together a training program, and we did this in conjunction with Adobe, with Aldus, uh, and our internal, because that was kind of the heart and soul of it, uh, of the key software. Was that you knitting together those pieces to get ready for, for yeah, that absolutely, launch? Absolutely, absolutely. Now, no, it, it was not all just me. I mean, if it wasn't for the fact that it had some really you know, sharp people at Adobe that were willing to help. Uh, the folks at Aldus uh, were, were fantastic. I came to the conclusion that of the software products that were there, and there were three candidates, the Mac Publisher, um, Manhattan Graphics, and Aldus, that of those three that I thought the only one that really could kind of walk the walk at that point that had the resources, the, 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 the kind of the vision and the, the capability to at least to launch with was going to be Aldous. And so, and I didn't want to have too many. I wanted to keep it a real simple message right. because we remind you, we had to train a dealer sales organization that knew nothing about this, right? And so we had to keep it very simple for our own salespeople and then the dealer salespeople. And so we restricted the program to, you know, we kind of tried to make it exclusive. Kind of 150 dealers were all that were going to be in the first phase of the program. So we had our field sales guys pick, you know, and work with who they thought were the best dealers that could actually handle this you know, that, that were committed to the training program that was needed, you know, and then we rolled out a program uh, to do that, to train them. Uh, and I can get in more details about that if you want, but uh, essentially that's what we did. And then we supported it from kind of air cover, which was through PR and some advertising and obviously collateral materials. I would like to hear more about that because, um, you know, it's, it's interesting to me because you're essentially, uh, it seems to me, the, the key problem that you're trying to solve here is to educate the users to do something with computers that they hadn't done before. So it's like selling a, a new area of activity, if you Correct. will, is what it sounds like to me. And that is um, 
I think that's just an interesting, that's an interesting uh, situation to be in where you're educating, you know, you know more about what the <laughs> customer should be doing with technology than maybe they do. Which, but, but it's yeah. not a whole lot different. If you look at the history of, of personal computing, you know, VisiCalc, you know, which then later became, you know, Multiplan and then later one, two, three, and Excel. Right. Um, it was a spreadsheet. Well, people were already doing, you know, calculations. They were already doing kind of the fundamental equivalent of a spreadsheet. They were just doing it manually, you know, with a calculator. And so when you showed people a more automated way of doing it, it was very intuitive, okay. very simple. Word processing, people typed on typewriters. And so when you had a keyboard and a typewriter and a word processor, and guess what? Instead of doing whiteout, you can backspace, you know, and heaven forbid you can later cut and paste, you know, it, it's just very intuitive, okay? So the same thing when you came to desktop, to desktop publishing. People were already doing either, you know, uh, producing, you know, word processing documents and then having to cut and paste it and put a picture so that they could form their own layout, but it's very cumbersome. It's kind of the an analogous to what people had to do with spreadsheets before. It's very cumbersome. So when people saw it, it was extremely intuitive and oh. it was very straightforward. And the beauty of it and why I think it kind of helped go quite fast is most people that are in the press business, you know, that were that wrote you know, at back then it was everything was on paper, you know, the online wasn't really here. So everything was, was into magazines and to uh, newspapers. Well, they kind of were pretty aware of, of the issues that editors have to do to cut and paste and get things in, to get their articles to fit in certain layouts. So they already had a really strong knowledge of it. So it made it really easy to talk with you know, the subset of, of, of um, you know, reporters and editors that were interested in the space, they got it instantly. Hmm. It was really easy, and then it was really easy for them to be very enthusiastic about it because they could, they could just, they could feel it, right? They had a lot of empathy for our customer because in a way they were, or people in their organizations were. So it. It, it, it made it quite simple because the products were really good. The price point, you know, was, would pay for itself in, you know, oftentimes would pay for itself in three, four months, right? So this had a terrific ROI, you know, for the business, uh, you know, especially for the professional user. And so it, it was just a fairly, it was kind of what I consider kind of the big bang. They're all, you know, kind of, they're all coming together. You know, you had a great product at a great time. The people that were communicating it were understanding it. There was a crisis in the company. So our sales guys were looking for a winner. This was a winner. So people like to be part of winners. And so everything kind of came together nicely. And that's part of why it just really took off. I see. Well, maybe we could, maybe we could talk about some of the preparations and things that you did, you know, for that launch, and then, in, and then um, the reaction, and then if you could describe to us how people sort of focused in on it, and mm -hmm. what were your signals that hey, this is. This is kind of meeting our hopes. Right, right. Yeah. Well, it probably started with, you know, even in the very early before we had actually launched, uh, you know, we showed it off, like I said, to, you know, kind of focus groups. We actually did some focus groups, but we did some informal ones first, our internal guys, and then the Stanford Publishing. Then that led us to have enough confidence that this might be real. And we want to see how big and to whom. So we got different segments of people from different, you know, kind of vertical whether they're graphic arts or whether they're advertising or whether uh, corporate tech doc people. So we got a, a variety of people to come to our focus group and that kind of helped us refine it. But that was also where we figured out what the name was going to be. Hmm. Um, you know, at, at the point as I was going through the initial investigation that, that, that first six, eight weeks, you know, the guys at all disliked desktop publishing as the name. Um, I'll, I'll get it mixed up, but the guys at Adobe liked another name, 
uh, and Jonathan Siebold liked another name. They were all either professional publishing, electronic publishing, desktop publishing, PC publishing was another one. And so we kind of like, I would, did not want to call it PC publishing. Yeah. I, I, I made that decision. I, I wrote that off because I didn't want, I thought we were so far ahead of the PC you know, the, the Microsoft, IBM side, that I didn't want to have anything that could get stolen. Because the mm. original IBM, the original PC was the Apple personal computer. And it, next thing you know, IBM came out and the PC became the PC, right? right? Mm. Apple was like a, an afterthought. You know, the PC was the IBM PC and we were the Apple, mm. right? The Apple II, not the PC. And so I didn't want to risk that whatever this category, I didn't want it to get usurped. Mm. Okay, so I want it to be distinct where it was a new category and we were so far ahead, I thought, I thought we had three years, you know, at least, at least two years, but probably three years at Head Start so we could really establish ourselves. So, so that was one gone. The other ones I was kind of like not sure about. Um, and so then we went to our kind of focus groups and for the most part, the target group that we were going after, which was not the ultra high end, because we didn't have a product, and we weren't going to have a product for the ultra high end for probably three to five years. Uh, they felt th they didn't think professional. It, it, bottom line is, when we did all the ranking, what came out the the most, uh, the best was desktop publishing. They thought it was comfortable. It it mm. it did the publishing, which was the kind of the high quality. But the fact that it was desktop implied that it was kind of theirs. It yeah. wasn't personal because it was shared, right? Because our general view is if you're going to buy a $7,000 laser printer, probably it's not just for one piece, one Mac, but it's going to probably be for two or three. It's going to be in a small work group. And so it, we wanted to be desktop. We didn't want it to be work group because that seemed too big. You know, professional didn't seem right. Electronic didn't seem too personal. And plus Xerox was doing electronic mm. publishing. Um, and I'm like, mm, don't want to go there. Okay, so we wanted to create our own, and, and also personal computers were also called desktop computers, and so we felt that that was a good place to go. So we ended up going with that as the brand, because we knew whatever, whatever, we were going to be doing all the advertising and the major PR and the push, so whatever name we gave it was going to be what, what happened. Right. And so uh, we did that, and that's how we launched it. And could you describe, um you know, what happened uh, right after the launch? You know, what was it like for you? You know, were you watching sales reports come in afterward? No, sure, or sure. How, you know, what was I'm that? Sure, you what, do all that. How'd you experience that? Yeah, I mean, you know, pretty confident it was going to be a big success. I mean, I remember very early on, you know, in the first you know, marketing plan I put together, I said, this is going to be, you know, this is going to be a billion dollar business oh. here within, you know, three, four, five years. I mean, this is going to be big because you could just tell. I mean, anybody we showed it to that was qualified goes, wow, <laughs> I would like one of those. <laughs> right. So to, to me, it was now a question of, did we have the sales and marketing? Did we have the distribution and the communication to attract the people so that they could go get a demo? Because hmm. if we could get people to get hands on and get a demo, one, we're going to sell Macintoshes, but we're going to sell the full system because this is really compelling. And so it was a question of making sure our channel didn't screw it up right, that we got people that could talk articulately about it. And so we got our field sales organization to, to you know, the guys that were really kind of the go-getters, you know, they were into it because they're looking for a winner and they're kind of early. We, every sales organization has its own early adopters, hmm. right? And so picking them were, and getting them to self-select and getting dealers to self-select that they were kind of early adopters willing to try new things was really key. Um, and then we got a, in the field, we had field marketing specialist and business development specialists. Those were Apple people in, their, in all the seven regions that we had. There's one in each. And I was able to kind of work with them. They didn't work for me, but I kind of co-opted their energy to, to support this program. 
and one would help from more of an being more of an expert on subject matter expert the other one was more on a field promotion and how to attract uh, customers and how to put on seminars and things like that so we put together all the materials to help them do that and all the training to help them do that and then they then manage their uh, dealers uh, to actually be successful and so my job as you know kind of I was the desktop publishing marketing manager I kind of had a virtual P&L for that area kind of like a product line manager at yep. a, and so uh, no one kind of reported to me but I kind of had the budget I had I could direct Marcom you know advertising and PR um, I could influence pricing which was important <laughs> I could uh, direct training programs and materials and then I could work with sales to make sure that they did a good job of selecting the appropriate you know qualified dealers mm. and so that was my job that's what kind of what you do as kind of a product line manager if you think of it that way mm. I, I have a question sure so it, why was this program this push um, by Apple um, so critical like in in the absence of this, um, what would have happened? Would Aldis, what, Aldis still would have had their own marketing, right? Yeah. But um, why wouldn't uh, why wouldn't this have taken off without Apple's major push? Well, we don't know if it would or wouldn't, mm -hmm. right? Because all we know. Uh, having been on the other side, <laughs> you know, when I left Apple, I was CEO of a, a software company, you know, that worked closely with Apple as well. It sure helps to have the big brother <laughs> that has the resources to to kind of drive it because everyone pays attention. Mm. You know, it was not hard to get someone from a magazine to want to come interview and learn about stuff. So anytime or to give a talk or to, if we host a seminar, we're going to get, you know, 250 people to show up, not 25 mm -hmm. or not three. Mm. It's just, we could do it at a scale. And we had the, you know, we had the, the image, the brand, you know, the wherewithal. Mm. And so I, I think it goes a long ways to really, you know, providing the, you know, kind of the, the impetus to, to really be successful comes from that. Hmm. Yeah, it was a time of crisis for Apple. You know, what would have happened with Apple if desktop publishing hadn't come about? What would have happened to the Mac? And the Mac was not doing well. It would, the software, it, we just didn't have the breadth of software yet at the mainstream business level. You know, Excel didn't come out really for another year. You know, and it was, it was really two years later before it's really good. <laughs> you know, yeah. Word was 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 there, and it was taking a while to get good. But we just had a we just didn't have a lot of software. Hmm. You know, and meanwhile, the IBM PC you know had a lot of software and is the de facto standard. So for us to we were doing reasonably well in colleges because we had done the Apple University Consortia, the Apple II was was doing was well in in K to 12, but the IBM PC was, had basically taken over business and was in encroaching into the home mm -hmm. uh, where, we, where the Apple II had been relatively successful, but it, it was going there. And so if the Mac didn't come in and establish itself, you know, uh, the IBM PC would have probably ultimately, I believed, you know, kind of moved the Apple II out of K to 12 as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm and probably would have eventually taken us out of, you know, university as well. Mm -hmm. And so we needed to have something that gave, you know, staying power to the Macintosh and by luck, you know, and I'll, I'll say luck, I, I'd give it more credit to, you know, to Steve, because Steve, without knowing about desktop publishing, Steve understood the value of fonts and graphics and WYSIWYG and, you know, you know, what you see is what you get and cutting and pasting, all the things that were the fundamentals for a next, a next wave of computing. Mm -hmm. And it just happened that when you have that coupled with, you know, a, a, a product like LaserWriter, you have the foundation for what then somebody that understands the problem of publishing and the graphic arts 
could do page layout. Mm -hmm. And that became a whole new category. And we is just the right place, at the right time. My view is I stepped into, you know, all the basic embryonic material was there, but it just hadn't launched, it just hadn't hatched yet mm -hmm. as, as something. But it, it was close and it just needed somebody to kind of bring it all together at the right time. Mm -hmm. And I happened to be the person that had the opportunity to do that. And I saw it quickly, it was self-evident to me and had the benefit of working with some really talented people, both inside and outside the company to, 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 to have a go and, you know, it took off like a rocket. Hmm. Does a moment stand out for you when, you know, you saw the rocket really take off from the pad instead of blowing up on the pad where you were like, wow, this, I'm right, it is happening. <sighs> you know, I knew, I knew is the right thing the, when the demo at the Stanford publishing. It was just, I remember saying to, you know, to the guy that was a summer intern, Reg Jones was his name, and you know some of the guys that you know at our creative service. I'm like, wow, we have an absolute winner if we don't if we don't screw it up. You know, and I was just you know I went to my boss, you know, and the guys in my the business marketing. I said, this is going to be big, and they go, ah oh, no, you know, calm down. You know, I said, no, this is going to be a billion dollar business. You know, and they just thought maybe I was being a little hyperbole, but I, I really, really knew it. And then once we got it, once we did our, we did a rollout of, I think there's 12, 10 cities or 12 cities. Well, basically we got, took a person from Adobe, a person from Aldis, and a, a person from Apple. Um, and we split into two teams. Uh, Paul Brainerd headed one, was the head of one team and I had the other team. And we had, you know, those, the, the three, you know, people. And we basically went and we trained, um, you know, we trained dealers and our own sales, uh, external sales guys and our, you know, business development managers that w were attending also. So we went out and did a, a training and that was over a one week period, maybe stretched it a little bit more because we basically went city to city to city. Yeah. You know, it's like exhausting, right? <laughs> but it was hilarious. It was really fun. And, um, seeing people's eyes and these were salespeople to see their eyes go wow that was just further evidence you know and then when then then as we got into the q4 we started putting on you know seminars we we spent we spent money most dealers had something called co-op funds, mm -hmm. which is if they sell, they get kind of credit, but they can use it to marketing and advertising. So we, we took advantage of those co-op dollars and some field marketing dollars to put on seminars where we would, we would go get the customer to come and we would bring the dealers, right? So then we would put on the presentation, the dealers would be there to follow on. And those early ones were without exception big successes and at that point we're like okay now it's just add water you know <laughs> it's it's really just stay with it you know keep the quality high and keep methodically increasing the number of dealers that are capable of handling it and then also evangelize to get more software because we didn't want to be just dependent on you know all this because you never know what could happen with a small company yeah. right right and so you know, at that point, I got a guy named Doug Sleater to become my dedicated evangelist uh, in, in our evangelism group, and he was just focused on desktop publishing products. And so he went out, he and I would go out and talk to any uh, prospective developer that was interested in graphics or was doing graphics um, type software um, to try to get them to bring it over onto the Mac. Okay. Uh at what point did you see Mac and LaserWriter sales start to turn around? Oh, almost instantly. Wow. Yeah, almost instantly. I don't have the numbers, but almost instantly. Yeah. Yeah. So you really knew this was working. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then they just kept going up, going up. And obviously we also, at that point, okay, we got through the basics. Now it's like, okay, how do we start to really grow this? $7,000 printer is tough. I wanted to get it under five very quickly. So that became the next focus. What can we do to get the price point? And obviously mm -hmm. volume matters, but what can we do to get the price point? Because my view is if we get it, 
We get the whole solution to be well under $10,000 because back then a Mac was $24.95. You know, we can get that down, $19.95, this, you know, and some software, we get the whole thing to under 10. That's a magic price point, I thought, for small business in particular. So we then started to have to do the product marketing discussions, you know, and the, you know, the, the nice discussions with finance as to why this is worth doing and how to forecast it. And so then you start getting into the guts of, of building a real business. Mm. You know? so, so you had influence into the pricing too. Oh, absolutely. Wow. I didn't set it, but I strongly, I was a very strong advocate and is mm. myself, sales and the product manager, Bruce, Bruce Blumberg. Yeah. Um, which unfortunately didn't come to our session, but he at the time was, he, was, he did it for I think the first year, and then he, he left and another gentleman named Brody Keese came in. <coughs> and so that is just the balance between, you know, if you can, um, you know, lower the price will increase the sales. I mean, that's the balance and the, you know, balancing profit, sales, Correct. All, all of this. You, you got to be a business too. Yeah. You know, and Apple, as you know, has historically not been the cheapest, you know, company. They're a premium brand, a premium product, you know, and we wanted, and we felt we had a really strong position here. But that being said, you want to make money, but you want to broaden your reach. Because right. my view is we had three years to establish ourselves as the, the de facto standard. Mm -hmm. And if we could do it in two years instead of in four years, we were probably going to be in a good shape for a very, very long time. Mm. And so, you know, I had a very strong view that we had to do that. And we had to prove that we were successful so then the software guys would also then commit to us, mm -hmm. right? You know, because the software guys were, you know, were not committing to the Mac because they didn't think the Mac was going to survive. Mm -hmm. You know, it was hard to change from doing, you know, kind of DOS programming to this object-oriented graphics program. It's different, so it's hard. Now, some loved hard; they liked the challenge; they were attracted to it. But others were like, "Show me the business case. Show me that this is going to have a great install base." Mm -hmm. Right, because you know, they can, you know, people are conservative, and so we needed to show it's going to be successful. It's all self fulfilling, right? Mm -hmm. You got to be a certain success breeds success, and it's a increasing returns if you do it right. And so we were trying to establish that, and you know, it was all you had to think of it holistically, and I, th I think we did a pretty good job of doing mm -hmm. so. How did, as it becomes clear that this that desktop publishing is a success um, it's reflected in the numbers um, that it's turning around you know Mac and laser writer sales I would imagine that within the company uh, everyone would want to get on board and then externally other people would say hey this is something I really need to pay attention to so um, I would be interested to hear you talk about, you know, how did that reshape things within Apple and when did you start to see uh, competition coming that you worried about? Um, well, the two things. First, yeah. first, you know, first, you know, kind of the effects. I mean, the first six months people were inside Apple. There were a lot of you know, I don't know, but there's no other, there's nothing else going on. So that's kind of the only game in town. No, n nothing else was really working, at least in the business mm. sector. In university, it was still having, you know, it, you know I think good success. Um, but in the business sector, we were kind of, the, we were kind of it. We kind of were the chance to, to, you know, to do something. And so, but people were kind of leery because it was a different way of doing it. Um, you know, uh, the head of product development, you know, he thought it was stupid. Hmm. You know, he told me point blank that, that doing it was stupid because that's not the way Apple does stuff. Apple is a, you know, horizontal personal computer. We don't do vertical marketing. Hmm. And I, you know, you know, nicely said I disagree. And fortunately others, you know, including John Scully were, you know, and you know, John Zeisler, my boss, and 
Um, uh, Bill Campbell, they let me do it. Okay, they were kind of cons nervous. They thought I was a bull in a china shop a little bit, to be honest, because I, you know, you're either helping me or you're not. So if you're not, get out of the way kind of guy. And, you know, I probably ruffled a few feathers along the way. But after it became very evident uh, that it was successful, and the, most of the lead sales guys in our field, they loved it. Mm. They were, they instantly got it. They are my biggest supporters and champions. You know, and it wouldn't have happened without the strong support from our field organization. But once it became pretty successful, then, you know, everybody, oh yeah, what a great idea I had, you know, <laughs> right? And, and, and that's just the nature, you know that, that's human nature. And so then it started to go. And then at that point, you know, started off me and a summer intern, right? And then after about nine months, it was pretty easy for me to get resources. Mm. And then at that point, I was a key part of anything that went on at Apple. Anytime mm -hmm. we launched a new product, they always had me come give an update to the press about desktop publishing. Mm -hmm. Anytime w there was any major anything, you know, I was part of that. So then I, the whole desktop publishing story got included in pretty much everything at mm -hmm. Apple from a marketing standpoint. And you were the sort of uh, face of that to the press and the outside world. Yeah. And okay. to the extent that I could get John Scully to be the face um, at certain events, I would always try to get him to give a speech, you know, because one, it helped inside of Apple to have the CEOs, you know, clearly, you know, articulate about desktop publishing, but also talking about, you know, how it's, you know, this great thing that kind of helped, but it also attracted and showed credibility to the outside world. Right. So, and so I, I would do that with the big events, I'd try to get him. Uh, with the smaller events, you know, I would do it. And for any, you know, day-to-day -day press stuff, I was the point person. How much influence did you have on uh, product development in the sense of, you know, doing, having getting the engineering team to do the Mac 2 and to incorporate color things like that that was already most of most of the roadmap of the Mac was pretty much going mm. you know um, I was a voice like others in the company for needing a hard drive you know <laughs> for you know just having a bigger screen, having some slot. I mean, doing things that were expandable because work group needed it. Mm -hmm. And the high end, I, the high end of, of the desktop publishing business needed it. And so, but there are others that, you know, th that same input was coming from the university guys, mm -hmm. right? Because they needed the science and engineering, you know, applications needed it just as much as we needed it. Mm -hmm. And so, um, that, that was not that difficult. The, the price point of the laser writer and the features of the laser writer, expandable font sets, those were things that we, you know, my group and myself, you know, strongly influenced working closely with the product managers. So was that uh, the, the development of the laser printer and its technology was in some ways as important to you as what was going on with you know, this line for the, the Macintosh? I mean, was, was the laser printer more important to desktop publishing um, than any other area within Apple? Well, it's the enabler. You know, the Macintosh is obviously, you know, bread and butter, you, you needed it, you know, but, you know, one could say I could have just done, if there wasn't a, a Macintosh, I would have figured out how to do it tied to a PC. Right, but that really wasn't, that wasn't Apple. We are tried to do the full thing. Right. You know, and, and the Mac was so far ahead of the PC anyway. It was the obvious choice. And so the way we looked at it, and the way we even modeled it financially is basically, I forget, it's like, it's almost like children, 2.2, <laughs> right? It's kind of like for every laser rider, there's like two or 2.2 2 Macs that go with it. Right. You know, and that was kind of the norm. You know, sometimes you'd have one, sometimes you'd have three or four, but it averaged out to about every laser rider, at least the initial year. Now, and there might be follow on sales of Macintoshes, and, and that was part of our pitch, which was, 
you know, my pitch to the executive staff when I launched desktop publishing was desktop publishing was going to be the Trojan horse to get Macintosh into business. Right. right. And so that was the pitch. And that's why I thought it was, it was, I thought it was going to be big, but even if it wasn't big in and of itself, it was going to be a valuable Trojan horse to get us on the price lists in any corporation and to get us into business to be an approved product. And then from there, I thought the ease of use and just the greatness of the Macintosh would peel into other, other parts of an organization. Mm. And in fact, that did happen. Um, so. Yeah, I was wondering how you would, um, if you could talk more about that, like how could you, um, could you tell by seeing uh, who bought things like customer information if this Trojan horse strategy was working? Uh, you could only get it from, you know, back then you don't have the same level of CRM and data that we mm. have now. We just take it for granted that you'd have all that information now. <laughs> Mind you, you're back in 1985, 86, 87. That kind of information didn't exist. Uh, you had to really pull it. Um, now, anecdotally, and from reports that you would get from dealers and from our field sales, they would say absolutely. They would get into a company, get on the price list, and then six months later, they'd be selling Macs into hmm. not just the Marcom group, but into the marketing. And then it'd get into a product group. And then it, you know, and so yeah. we saw it expand. And so, and we saw our sales you know, expand. And so while we, I, I wish I had, you know, RFID tags on everything and I could have <laughs> tracked everything and we had people, you know, uh, you know, registering and saying where they got it and why, we didn't have all that kind of, we didn't have that level of, right. of data. So you had to do it, you know, kind of the old fashioned way. You had to do surveys and you had to do informal, you know, surveys you know, and you know, with your field sales guys and with customers when you would go s speak with them. And when you go speak with them, you'd, you'd ask them those kind of questions. And sure enough, you saw it not only expand in the, the, that group that got initially, but they would talk about how you know, a guy from another department came over and said, oh, what's that? <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. And they'd do a demo, and next thing you know, that guy's buying it. Right. So especially as we got into, you know, got the Mac 2, and we started getting, at this point, Excel was there, and Word was really good, and there's good database pro. All of a sudden, there's, re and our, our networking was getting better and better. We even had a modem that, you know, worked <laughs> so you could tie into, you know, online stuff. You know, it started to become a real business computer. So these, the, the years to 1989, you're, you know, obviously contending with growth and also, you know, pushing growth by ex the means that you've talked about, extending these dealer networks and um, all of that. Um, what were some of the, the signature um, signposts or, or challenges in these years as, you know, desktop publishing was growing to a billion dollar business? Um, just some of the the key episodes, I guess, if you will, in that story? Well, oof. I mean, let's take it in kind of phases. First yeah. phase was just launching it. Simple product, the narrow solution is really simple page layout based around, you know, all this Mac paint, <laughs> you know, as a <laughs> graphics and, you know, a word we had MacWrite and Microsoft Word was starting to, to be part of it. And there were a couple other graphics programs. That was pretty simple. You know, as we moved into the next year, then we twofold. One, you start to have the inkling of potential competition. Okay, uh, Ventura was probably, well, all through this time, Xerox, you know, they were trying to push their publishing system. Hmm. You know, their, I think it's their star-based publishing system. Mm -hmm. And we loved them because they were spending a lot of money on, on ads, <laughs> right? And I don't know if they sold any. If they did, it was a small number. But they were spending a lot of money, especially as we started doing, they started 
that I think they probably did 10x what we did. Right. And and we sold 95% of the product. <laughs> You know, so we loved, we lo I personally loved them because they were helping to educate uh, people about this whole electronic, digital, you know, computer, you know, publishing. And we were the only people that really had a good product and certainly a cost effective product mm -hmm. and one that was widely available that you could get. So, so that was taking place. So that was part of kind of phase two or, you know, starting into phase two, but we started to have competition. They, uh, I think Xerox bought Ventura at right. some point, and I'm not sure what year, whether it was 86 or early 87, but it was, and I was trying to get Ventura to port over, and they're like, now nah, you're already in bed with Aldis, and we're like, no, Aldis and you are very different. Of course, Aldis would say that they could do everything, but they really were very different. One was a longer, could do longer documents, this was more page-oriented, well, right. that was more document. Uh, ultimately, then Cork came out and did what, you know, did what you know Ventura kind of fit and, right you know and they they became a real powerhouse but but they they weren't there until I don't think until really 87 if I'm not mistaken mm -hmm. may have been late 86 87 um, and uh, unfortunately Manhattan graphics just never really got there with ready set go mm. uh, I think ultimately they got bought by Letraset, which was a kind of a font and graphics company that right. wanted to be in the business but they never really got it they had a couple of misstarts. They did, I think they bought Mac Publisher or some one or the other, and then they ultimately bought Ready, Set, Go. Uh, it's a shame because if they'd gotten the resources, if Ready, Set, Go and got the resources earlier, they could have probably ultimately gotten there, hmm. but they never really did. Um, you know, Quark, then it became, it was kind of fun, phase two, you kind of had Aldous and Quark. So you had, you, you had real choice. Right, and, and, and that was good for customers, it was good for our dealers. You know, Aldous didn't like it, you know, because they loved having kind of a monopoly position, but they kept telling us they were gonna go onto the PC. Mm. And it's like, okay, well, you can't have your cake and eat it too. <laughs> you, you want us to be exclusive, but you're not gonna be exclusive, so hello. <laughs> so, you know, and it was probably both. It, so it was, it was always a good relationship, but always had a little tension, sure. right? Which was healthy, I think. And then when Quark came in, that was nice. Um, as you go into later, then you start having different types of, of other products, you know, forms products, hmm. uh, PowerPoint. Um, we kind of usurped into desktop publishing because it was kind of layout and it was graphics, even though it was more mm. presentation then. So we started to then market that the suite of, of products was not just simple newsletter page layout, but you could do long form, you could do forms, you could do even you know personalized things like presentation. So we started to s talk about a broader category but that was like two and a half, three years later, right? When we were starting to broaden the, 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 the talk, okay? And so um, that was kind of the evolution. And so that was the product evolution. That was the, the segmentation evolution. Uh, we started to have, you know, competition, as I said, from on the PC side, but they never really, in, during the time that I was actively involved, which was 85 through 88, okay. and into 80, well, 88. I basically did it for three years. And then I, I went and did a, I got kind of enamored by multimedia and I left being desktop publishing to go do a special project working for Scully, uh, looking at the multimedia space. Oh. Okay, so that was what I did, you know, because at this point app, desktop publishing was a billion dollar business. Everyone was in my shorts, you know. <laughs> it, it was not the startup that mm. I that I loved and it kind of gotten mainstream it was in everything mm. and at that point you know I personally was wanting something new to do because wow. that was a lot of work I mean I basically you know launched a you know a company you know because I, I was working all the time I mean it was it was really it was fascinating would I do it again absolutely but I mean I was working as if I was a startup CEO at a at a company it was 24 mm. 7 you know, for almost three years. And that would be a hyper growth startup for, oh, yeah. to go no, from was, zero dollars yeah, it was, it to was a wild. billion in three yeah. years. It was wild. I was traveling 50% of the time. I was, got Apple to set up desktop publishing groups in Canada, UK, Europe, um, and, you know, set up things in Japan. 
you know, so I was very interested internationally, uh, as we may have talked earlier. Yes. I was born and raised uh, in Southeast Asia, always, you know, come from a family that's very global thinking. And I always, from day one, thought of it as, you know, we needed to be the de facto global, you know, leader of this. And so, you know, I enjoyed that and I enjoyed setting up new things. And so that's what I spent a lot of time with our field organization, evangelizing customers and uh, new perspective developers, you know, and then also getting, you know, getting our different parts of the world kind of tuned up to it. Was this traveling basically to the great metropolitan areas of the world or which I guess by the nature of things would coincide with that would be where publishing was going Correct. on, but it's like where anything was going That's on. That's where everything. That's you go to where you go to where you know the business is and so the businesses you know are in the major markets mm -hmm. you know it's certainly the early adopter business and we're in year you know one two and three of a new way of doing stuff so you go to you go to places where the early adopters in the united states it's the coasts mm -hmm. it's less in the middle but we would do some in the middle but they were you know chicago and dallas were always a little slower huh. to be honest uh, historically um, while the coast were much more early adopter london paris more so, you know, Toronto, Montreal, Montreal probably more than Toronto. I mean, they're just, <laughs> yeah. it, you know, Vancouver, you know, those are all more early adopter places. And you know, we'd go, and then you'd also go to parts of Asia, you know, to, to go to places where things were happening. Right. Well, sure. please go ahead. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> um, you mentioned, so you, you decided to, to shift into multimedia. Was that, um, did you see multimedia as sort of the, you know, similarly to when you had started desktop publishing, that was going to be the new desktop publishing, that was going to be a new area of focus to drive sales, and did you see like a similar constellation of, of technologies that, you, that sort of became part of this? Um, what, what components were there to multimedia? Was it HyperCard or the CD-ROM or? Quick time. Yeah, D all the above. Uh, <laughs> I mean, as the as the person that was kind of had you know kind of a spokesperson you know face you know for Apple in kind of the publishing, which which is also interpreted by others the kind of the intersection of graphics, graphics you know and creative with computers, mm -hmm. right? Anything in in that area you could call media, mm -hmm. people would come to me. They'd either come to Doug, my, you know, Doug Sleeve, the evangelist, or it'd come to me, or it'd come to somebody else and they would call me. So I started seeing all kinds of things in this new emerging interactive media. Mm. And instead of being, you know, printed media, it was now, the screen was the paper. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was interactive media. And so you started seeing, you know, animation, you start seeing hyperlinking. I mean, HyperCard came out, and that's like, wow, SuperCard, you know, mm -hmm. was another one. But you started seeing CD-ROM. You started seeing that there was, again, the same embryonic nutrients <laughs> kind of floating around there that it felt like there was something really interesting that was there. Mm -hmm. And I believe that it was Apple's kind of birthright mm. to, to just like they had done with desktop, with graphical user interface and, and the Mac, and just as they'd done with desktop publishing, that it was Apple's birthright to figure that out, harness it all together, and get it into the world. Mm. Now, was it all there? Was it as mature as I was fortunate to have gotten involved with the beginnings of what became desktop publishing was was multimedia as mature as when I did started that no it was mm -hmm. not but I thought it would get there and so I went to you know I went to to Scully and had a long discussion you know saying that look I think I'm done doing desktop publishing I'd like to I think a new challenge I'm either going to leave the company or I'm going to do something else and mm -hmm. he said what would you like to do and I said what I'd like to do is I think it's you know it's this whole multimedia area. I'm pretty fascinated. I think it could be really interesting, 
He said, great, why don't you, I said, there's these, I forget the number of guys, but it's like, you know, six, seven people that from around the company that I kind of put together into a task force. Hmm. And we went and looked at what we could do in the multimedia area. Hmm. Hmm. And then came back and presented kind of a, a business plan Unfortunately, it didn't get approved huh. by exec staff. Uh, you know, there was certain member of, of the exec staff that, you know, was head of product development that I, I believe, you know, kind of didn't think it was a smart idea once again. Who's uh, that going to say? And I just, um, you know, I could tell that it was going to be a lot of uh, turmoil, hmm. a lot of politics to, to get it done. And... You know, at that point, there's a lot of fighting at the senior level, mm. and I was unfortunately purview to seeing it. Mm. You know, when mom and dad are fighting, the kids <laughs> don't have a good time. Mm. And it was just, it, the apple was getting kind of funky. The, mm. the senior management was just not healthy. And mm. I made a decision that I was going to leave Apple. I still was fascinated by the prospect of what multimedia could be, mm. and I'd met pretty much everybody and anybody that's doing anything interesting mm. in the multimedia field, mm. and I ended up uh, leaving to become the CEO of a company called Macromine, mm. right. uh, which later became Macromedia, and you know helped them kind of. They had a, a, an interesting product, and we uh, they were com they were working on a, a, a new advanced version that I actually thought was going to be pretty compelling. Mm -hmm. and the first one I thought was a little, a little too, you know, amateur, but this one was going to be a really you know high quality product. Um, and so I said, you know, I will join on two conditions. One is will, you know, let me bring in a top tier venture investor. And I brought in Klein, John Doerr and uh, Kleiner Perkins, and that you move from Chicago to San Francisco. <laughs> I thought San Francisco was the obvious place to birth this whole new thing. Is kind of the it was kind of the creative center in the Bay Area, and it but it's close enough to Silicon Valley. So we kind of called that area kind of multimedia gulch, <laughs> and um, we were essentially the first company to really be there. Mm -hmm. that was doing multimedia. There was another company that was also about the same time called Paracomp that was doing a 3D, you know, 3D graphics. Mm. It was more scientific, you know, driven at that mm. point. <coughs> Later it merged, you know, it, Authorware, and Macro Mind merged to become Macromedia. Mm -hmm. So, um, but that was how we got started. Mm -hmm. And so. And before we get into that story, I would be, I just, this might be where you were going, Hans, and I'd be interested to know, like, when you had that task force at Apple mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. on multimedia or interactive media, um, what did you see and what was the business plan that you proposed mm -hmm. uh, to Apple? Um, without getting into too much detail, because, sure. you know, I mean, it was internal. But, but essentially it was to create, uh, we thought the, the obvious place that the early adopter place for multimedia, you know, and interactive media was education. Mm. That was the obvious first place. Now we thought it would also go into corporate training and training in general, and ultimately into the home as a, you know, what you would call a, you know, video game player. But we thought that you know, so what you would start is you would you, you would really focus on education, um, and so we had a group that was that was a lab, a multimedia lab, in San Francisco, hmm. um, and so worked really closely with them, and they were tied in with you know National Geographic, Lucasfilm, et cetera. So worked really closely to see what we could do there, um, but also on the product side we you know, came up with an idea of essentially uh, two things, a player, you know, you would call it like a video game player today, mm -hmm. but it was a CD-ROM or maybe even video disc, not unsure what the right medium was just yet. Um, and it might end up using both. And over time it would be digital video, but back then to get real digital video, you needed something that was a bigger, right. you know, so that would only be good in certain educational, that, that'd be kind of like a teacher would control it as opposed to a kid, right? Mm. you know. But the, the notion was we'd have a player and the, the Mac, the Mac and would be the authoring 
platform, mm. and then we'd have a player user platform. And mm. we would go after education, because we thought that was a great way, again, a Trojan horse into education <coughs> was the obvious place. And then we'd take that also into corporate training. And then as we got more and more, it'd be natural to go into consumer. Mm. So that was the strategy. Uh, never was able to sell it internally uh, to be able to do it. And Actually, so it, it was the right thing to do. I, I personally, <coughs> I personally still think it was, you know, a multi-billion dollar, you know, loss on, on Apple's part personally for us not to have done that. We, we have something in our collection that's, um, that Apple did put out, and I don't know if you had anything to do with this, but it was, um, it was a, some software that was HyperCard stacks that um, and a cable that you would connect to a laser disc, yep. and you could yep. control this yep. laser disc from the hypergrad stack. Yep. Was that part? That of was all part of some of the prototypes okay. that were used to kind of show early, you know, early versions of what's possible. Hmm. And we had all kinds of stuff with uh, Lucasfilm, National Geo, uh, several other groups, uh, WBC, and. Boston, I mean, you know, some mm. of the PBS, you mm. know, guys that were early, the BBC had some interesting, I mean, we were talking to all the kind of wow, early adopter, major. early adopter players, and then some of the publishers as mm. well. They were all very interested. Now, it's a very conservative world, mm. you know, kind of educational publishing, very conservative, which is also the opportunity. Mm. And it, I can kind of hear the resonance of the desktop publishing in your description of it. You know, the the media player as kind of the shared laser writer and maybe, you know, mm. whatever the students would be consuming it on could be kind of like a lower end well, it was just different. Macintosh or something. It, it was different. Uh, it wouldn't take too many parallels. Okay. But maybe just because I think <laughs> you got to approach everything, every market opportunity is you know, you steal where you can, <laughs> but you got to make sure you don't, you know, you don't want to be to every problem's a nail, to a hammer every mm -hmm. problem's a nail. You don't want to do that. Right. When, when you need a screwdriver, use a screwdriver. Okay. And so, uh, no, <laughs> but there were a lot of things that you could take from the general Macintosh and the desktop publishing that was useful. But at the same time, you know, Nintendo, you know, and Sega were doing some pretty cool stuff in the video game world mm. that you could also steal from, mm. right? And so, you know, that was our view. I see. You know, we, we could have been probably, you know, something more akin to the PlayStation, mm. you know, but it'd be a Mac, Mac OS or Mac OS derivative, you know, PlayStation. Oh, you were thinking of like doing a, a box. Oh yeah, no, no, no. It would, we're a hard, you know, Apple's a, Apple's a compute company. So, you so know, not we would have done, yeah. we would have done, you know, authoring tools. You know, we would have evangelized and gotten really good authoring tools right. that ran on the Mac, you know, mm. Super Macs. I mean, you know, the Mac 2s and, you know, and 3s and 4s mm. and, right? <laughs> and then we wanted to, you know, envision there being a player. And a player would be, you know, the closest thing you would think of today is, is something like this, you know, the PlayStation, hmm. right? Wow. That sort of thing. So it would be a player because that's hmm, what yeah. you, you need something like that that's simple, that's easy, that's hmm. plug and play, that, that schools and consumers can deal with. Hmm. You know, if, if what they're doing is interactive media and games is the greatest, you know, form of interactive media that we know. But, you know, really good educational products are kind of have a lot of gamification to it. Mm -hmm. Right. And so if you're trying to appeal to to lure people in and engage them in your media and you make it interactive. And so hmm. you'll have a full suite of of things from, hmm. you know, test type product to just exploratory to game. And it's the whole breadth of educational yeah. material. Hmm. And this was all prior to, I mean, Apple did partner with Bandai to do that Pippin game console later on. That was later. <laughs> that was, some would say that was a derivative of some of our ideas. Hmm. Okay. Where did not probably the way <laughs> we would have <Yeah>. done. <laughs> <laughs> well, where did the term multimedia come from? You know, I'm not exactly sure. It was kind of in, 
in general usage mm. already. Uh, in uh, like we were big sponsors, um, you know, at the Media Lab, uh, oh, the MIT. MIT Media Lab. We, you know, I was kind of the point person for the the sponsorship mm. that we did there mm. during my last year, I think, of of desktop publishing, and that's another one of the things that kind of got me very, very intrigued. <laughs> you know, Nicholas Negroponte and his group, they're doing some really cool stuff. I think Bruce Blumberg ultimately, <laughs> went, he was, became a, he did a postdoc or doctorate there, you know. So s several people from Apple actually went there. Um, but I think the, the, the phrase was kind of there and is a question of would we change it? Mm is kind of got into the same desktop publishing discussion. Mm -hmm. mm. But since we never really did a marketing program, we never really got, f never had the opportunity to confront that challenge. Mm. And so it just became multimedia. And by the time I went to Macromine, you know, we said, you know, let's, we're not in a position to change a new, we're a small company. Mm -hmm. What we're gonna try and do is get Apple to embrace multimedia. <laughs> Uh, and we will become the multimedia company. So we kind of branded ourselves at Macromind the multimedia company. We tried mm -hmm. to be kind of the, the thought leader in the emerging multimedia field. Mm -hmm. And that was with our product called Macromind Director. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And by the time you, you did that negotiation to join Macromind, they were already developing software for the Mac. The Mac, okay. yeah. They had a product called VideoWorks Th hmm. They had a couple of games as well, but the the thing that I was intrigued by was a product they had called VideoWorks. Okay. And they had a they had a product. More importantly, is they had a product called VideoWorks Interactive, which was very buggy, but <laughs> it was it, it showed the vision of what might be possible as a, as an authoring and controlling software for putting together, you know, text, graphics, audio you know, into a flow much like a, you know, like an iMovie today, mm -hmm. right? But have interactive capability where you could link things. Mm -hmm. And so all of a sudden it became the authoring, cho authoring tool of choice for, you know, for the mainstream. Uh, Authorware did a more pedagogically, you know, uh, you know, structured version for high end, you know, kind of, uh, educational and kind of tech doc authoring, mm -hmm. but they were very professional, <coughs> sold it for a lot of money, you know, and did it through VARs and, you know, kind of high-end retailers. We went after kind of the mass, trying mm -hmm. to get to the kind of the early adopter developer kind of person mm -hmm. that we thought would, you know, infiltrate a lot of places. And, and it became a great prototype prototyping tool, but it also became an authoring tool for some, you know, for, for advertising and promotional and also prototyping for other stuff. <coughs> That's interesting. Um, well, how did, how did that trajectory at that company um, go for you? I mean, it sounds like it was it very much almost like a, a restart of the company, moving it, getting in, you know, very high profile, doing mm -hmm venture investor, yeah. um, new CEO. Yeah. Um, yeah, so maybe you could just describe to us the trajectory of your time there. Yeah, no, it was exciting. Um, <laughs> I mean, we launched a new product, you know, established ourselves in the, in the category. Uh, got up to about, uh, it, was, it was about 10 million in sales. So it went through the tough, get the first million. <laughs> <coughs> then, then you want to get to the 10 million. And then at that point, that's when it's, you're either gonna get bought or you're gonna you know, go to the next level. Mm -hmm. And at that point, you know, collectively, um, you know, we were looking to you know, um, try to possibly acquire some other software products. And so had several discussions about, uh, about uh, acquiring some other software products. I think during that time, you know, uh, our board um, decided that probably what would be maybe more interesting is to merge it with some other companies. And so they actually bought it, brought in another guy to be the CEO and hmm. lead that whole 
exercise, someone that was more senior to, to me, and uh, they brought in a guy who then, um, you know, I left at that point, and they brought in a guy to kind of do what became a roll-up of two other two other companies mm -hmm. and merged it to allow it to go public. And so yeah. about a year, I'm, I'm not sure exactly on the dates, but a year or two later, mm -hmm. uh, they had, you know, put together Macromine, um, Paracomp, who we tried to, you know, tried to acquire them, <laughs> or tried to get their product when I was there, uh, and then Authorware. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, there's another product that we tried to get that we never got. Or actually, two other products that we never got. One was from from Electronic Arts, and one was from Adobe. Uh -huh. You know, we tried to bring those in because they were doing some software. Mm. You know, that we didn't think, weren't sure that it fit, and we said, well, why don't we take it over? And you know, same thing. Uh, Electronic Arts had a uh, some studio products that right. were pretty good, but it wasn't getting the full time support that they needed. You know, mm -hmm. to really be productized, and so we thought we might be able to do something. But ultimately. It, that was the nucleus of the idea, and it turned out to be quite successful. Okay. So, you know, I left, uh, you know, vested all my shares and <laughs> went and started another company. Yeah, and, and, as, and you do, as you do in Silicon Valley. <laughs> I guess so. Um, Did you uh, have a question? Yeah, there? I guess before we get into that, um, so you were, you were in charge of the company during that crucial period where Director became mm -hmm. a big product. Mm -hmm. Could you, talk more about sort of the development of Director and then the push, um, the, the sales marketing push and the... the I mean, the Director was the, the natural next step up version of what was VideoWorks. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so we thought that it needed a name change, that VideoWorks 2 or 3 wasn't <laughs> the right because that was too, it didn't describe what it really was. And yeah. we thought it ought to be something that, you know, I, I thought it ought to be something that had a name that implied that you were kind of in control, you were the, you were the, you know, the director. And right. so um, a guy named Mark Cantor, who's the, one, of the, one of the co-founders of the company, um, we spent a lot of time you know, coming up with a lot of different names, bouncing a lot of different stuff, and we ultimately came that that was going to be a good name for it. Uh, got, I think, Clement Mock, if you remember that. He was, yeah. Clement was a top, um, one of our top creatives at Apple in creative services. He had, he had spun out to create, been his own uh, firm at that point, and we got him to help us with the graphics and all, you know, and then we, you know, had Regis McKenna, who, who was our PR firm at Apple. They were our PR firm at Mac. You know, so people that I knew and trusted, you know, brought them together to kind of help us with, you know, making sure we got the name and the image and the branding all right. And then, you know, we launched it at, um, I think it's Macworld, I think it's Macworld in like April of 1989. Uh, hmm. um, is also kind of our we had just moved the right. company, mm. right? And so we, we'd move the company. So it was kind of an introduction, it was kind of a launch of the company and the product mm. all at the same time. And, you know, we were, you know, big success. It was the right time. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I'd left and people knew my track record, so it was pretty easy to get attention, mm. you know, from all the, the, the media, both local and national. And so we got a lot of attention and uh, the product was really good. It was, a, you know, a sexy, gave sexy demos. <laughs> you know, we had a lot of interesting customers that would speak about how they were using it because they had been using, you know, they had been using VideoWorks, mm. even in VideoWorks Interactive, and we were able to get them in beta programs. So they were, we already had people. And so we just, you know, then launched it and got the same, you know, again, similar to desktop publishing, got certain dealers that were willing to, support it and we got, you know, I had to evangelize Apple to support mm -hmm. it and try to do something similar to what we had done desktop publishing one. There wasn't quite the same, there wasn't a John Skull champion mm -hmm. there, so it was a little bit harder. Mm -hmm. But, you know, but we were able to get, you know, at least at the local level, I knew everybody. And so we were able to get some pretty good success. And then Apple was quite interested in the area. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so we would, partner with them and tag into, you know, anything they were doing from a PR standpoint, from, you know, from, you know, whenever they'd give presentations, you know, I'd 
like at Boston, you know, Macworld used to be in Boston also, you know, we'd get on stage and, you know, give demos of our latest products to the, you know, to the, to the Mac faithful, <laughs> you know, so we were very engaged with Apple over the, you know, the time that I was at, you know, at, at Macromind and it was very helpful, uh -huh. but we broadened it from just, um, from just Apple. At that point, the PC was, was getting more and more, uh, you know, successful and more interested in that area. And so we were able to do some interesting deals uh, with some of the graphics cards uh -huh. companies and with Microsoft and IBM. Oh. We introduced a product called Macro, Macro Media. Huh. We had a cross-platform player huh. that if you published a, a director you know, movie file. Mm. <coughs> or file, it could be played back on other platforms. Uh. So it could be played back on a PC if it had the Macro Media player on it uh -huh. and so that's where the name macromedia comes from uh -huh. was from our player uh -huh. okay. engine and so we did pretty interesting um you know cross-platform you know deals with with microsoft with creative labs uh -huh. you know with the uh, ibm I'm, a, a lot of the guys on the pc side because right. they wanted to be able to you know have some kind of sexy stuff yeah you mentioned these use cases. What what were they of director? Um, it was everything from presentations. Uh -huh. You know, obviously you could do some really whiz bang presentations to mock ups of advertising. Uh -huh. You know, it's really good for that. Uh, people are using it for visualization, scientific and engineering visualization. Uh, pretty much anything where what you're looking to do is communicate an idea uh, in a short, simple way. Uh -huh. <laughs> it was a terrific tool to do that. Uh -huh. uh, we had people create, you know, uh, educational, you know, kids books, interactive uh -huh. books, you know, click, you know, fun, fun, you know, books. Uh -huh. um, and then we had people all the way taking them into actually more serious, you know, kind of publications, interactive publications. Uh -huh. But that would be probably the suite of it. Right. Huh. I remember um, Director had good hypercard integration. Mm -hmm. I remember playing a game by Cyan called Cosmic Osmo that was okay. a hypercard stack, but that used Director. But it would, launch, it would launch a Director file. Uh, yeah. Okay, yeah. So was that like, was hypercard integration a big, uh, a big part of the business or was mm. it mostly standalone Director? It was more standalone. Mm -hmm. uh, some, of our, some of our developers would use both. Mm -hmm you know, for their products, but most people used it as the, as the authoring tool and then the playback. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the future trajectory of that, well past your tenure with the firm, uh, was, yeah. you know, Adobe a, a acquired it and, right, it, it had a director. Yeah, much later, director. Uh, much yeah. later. It, much, went through, much it later. went through, you know, brought in, you know, um, our player then was usurped by Shockwave, right? Mm -hmm. Right, which was the next evolution. Then Flash was the next evolution. Right. You know, as they continued to make it, you know, lighter, mm -hmm. the footprint lighter. As you go into the inter as you go into the internet world, mm -hmm. as you leave the desktop and CD-ROM world, right, mm -hmm. where it's okay to be big, mm -hmm. right, and you go into the online world, you need to be small and fast. And then it ultimately becomes a video, you know, player, mm -hmm. you know, almost a code. You know, so right. it, it evolved quite a bit, but that's over, you know, 10 years. Mm -hmm. but, it, yeah. but it is interesting that the, f the form does stay the same, if you will. There's a director is for making the content. There's a there's a player there's a that's player. multi platform mm -hmm. and no, no the, the, yeah. the, the model the was established. The yeah. playbook was established. The technology underpinning changed. Mm -hmm. Interesting. <clears throat> so that was kind of part of what we contributed to the the industry and the industry thinking. We were kind of version one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And now we're probably version five, <laughs> yeah. right? You know, and or maybe six, <laughs> right? But that's twenty, you know, twenty five years later. Right. But you, so your next move was actually to stay in interactive media and co-found a video games company. Correct. Could you tell us about that? Well, I, you know, uh, when I left 
<coughs> when I left uh, Macromine is, you know, I was pretty enamored with, you know, interactive media. And it became pretty obvious to me that the mainstream application of interactive media at that point in time was games. Mm -hmm. You know, it, while education, uh, unless Apple or some big company was going to really get behind it, right, which they were not doing. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Um, you know, while I would have liked them to, <laughs> and I would have stayed there to have done it, they chose not to. You know, and um, so therefore you got to look and say, okay, well, if they're not doing it, you know, it's going to stay a fairly, you know, it's going to stay a pretty niche market. Mm -hmm. But mainstream, you know, interactive media, the best, the best guys, and some some of our best developers customers at, at, at Macromind were game guys. Hmm. And so hmm. I teamed up with one of those, a guy named Rob Fulop, uh, hmm. who had a small firm called Interactive Productions. And so we basically, I, I teamed up with him and we created a new company called PF Magic. Hmm. And it was focused on interactive entertainment. And, you know, we did some pretty interesting things. <laughs> Was that also in San Francisco? Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. And what were some of your... Um, South of Market of San Francisco as well. <laughs> that's kind of where you do mm. things. Or at least that's where Macromind was. And that's where I thought this should also be. Right. So we were right around South Park, if you know where that is. Um, well, I was... Uh, and you were with that firm for, was it... Seven years or so, probably or? about that. Yeah. It was a long. Wow. Yeah, it was a long. You know, it was basically two startups and one. Hmm. The, the, the first startup, um, first startup. I mean, we were doing some interesting things with the CDI platform, hmm. uh, which was a Philips based, and they had a whole big push. They were trying to. They were essentially trying to do some of what. I thought Apple should have done, mm. but they did it a little different, and they were the best thing that was there. Yeah, um, n didn't quite ever get there, but you know we thought they had a chance because you know Philips, sure, you know pretty big company, and they were willing to spend some serious money with developers to create content. Mm -hmm. Okay, because they were going to launch with a library of content, which I I, you know I thought great. It's not that far from the playbook. The only difference is they didn't have a Macintosh and all the, the super interactive media guys that we had. Mm -hmm. So I think we at Apple could have done it a lot better, but they were the best thing that was out there. Um, and so we gave it a shot at creating some products. You know, they funded it and, mm -hmm. you know, we create some products, but CDI never materialized mm -hmm. to be um, anything important. Mm -hmm. other, than, other than just a great place to have met some really, really smart people <laughs> and all a bunch of guys like us that were early adopters, you know, trying to create a new industry. Huh. And so it was, a, it was a really fun group of people. Uh, Business-wise, it n didn't seem like it was really going anywhere. We got intrigued with the notion of online games. Huh. Um, and so we ended up taking some money from AT&T um, their consumer products group, mm -hmm. who at the time was trying to create kind of a, a digital presence. They were making, I think they made five or six investments in Silicon Valley. Um, they were trying to create the new AT&T consumer products group. And so um, we thought they it was a natural for us to uh, work with them to create a, a way that you could play games over a phone line. Huh. You could play multiplayer, so you and you could play together even though you're, you know, five miles away or 50 miles away. Mm. So what's now very commonplace. But back then the internet, you know, this is the early 90s. Internet right. was still hadn't, you know, you didn't have Mosaic yet. You didn't have, you know, Netscape yet. It was, it was still in labs you know, or universities, not in mainstream. But Bell Labs had some pretty interesting voiceover data modem technology. Hmm. And we're like, perfect. We'll help them create a product that then working with either a Sega or a Nintendo, hmm. you could have a video game on that, leveraging this voiceover data modem, hmm. and people would be able to play 
and talk to each other at the same oh. time. Oh, cool. Wow. So uh, maybe a little ahead of its time. Well, yes. <laughs> and now it happens all the time. But, um, you know, so we put together a, you know, you know, a pitch to, to create this product with them. And they gave us, you know, a lot of money <laughs> and, and also funded the development. And we were about three months away from having a product <laughs> when the senior person in charge of that whole digital, that whole, you know, consumer group basically left the company. Mm. <clears throat> and the new guy that came in to take his place, and whether he got fired or didn't get promoted, we don't know all the politics, but that's the risk of working with a corporate. I mean, we'd been working with him for two years. Okay. And, mm. you know, when the new guy came in, he just said, oh. and he basically sh killed all five or six investments. Mm. Just shut them all down. And we're like, okay, <laughs> we no longer have a business. We could sue them. Yeah, great. And that'd take five years, uh -huh. right? Or we can just accept it and, you know, figure something out. And so I had some money. I uh, still had about a million bucks or something in the bank. I could either give it back to them and a venture group that had come in alongside of them. Uh, or I went to our board and said, the other choice is I can pivot it and we can just become a pure software, you know, entertainment company and not try to do anything else. Just do that. Right. and leverage the internet, because the internet now is happening. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought we, we had some interesting ideas of some products that we were doing, um, especially in this area called virtual pets, what mm -hmm. we called virtual pets. And so, you know, that's what we ended up doing. I laid off two thirds of the company, mm. kept, you know, the, the dozen people that were gonna focus, you know, I think it's 15 total. We kept, we were up to like 45 and we, kept just that 15 and we wow. launched a we came out with a product called dogs and then a product called cats <laughs> <laughs> d-o-g-z uh and c-a-t-z you know and we're very successful sold <laughs> i don't know how many million copies of them and uh, had a pretty interesting little business hmm. enough that you know about two and a half years later we got bought by um, Mattel it was, mm -hmm. it was actually actually it was it was the learning company mm. that bought us but then they got bought by Mattel so it was a, mm. a learning company which was doing a roll-up of a bunch of entertainment and learning products right. mm -hmm. uh, they ended up buying us and you know everything worked out but it was a long slug <laughs> <laughs> wow. so uh, it was a quite a quite an experience you know, being CEO of, of, of startups that go through this. Yeah, is, three changes. Yeah, you know, it sounds but, like. you know, that's what you do. That's what entrepreneurism is all right. about. Mm -hmm. You know, and you kind of, it's all about staying with it and not giving up and, you know, being with smart people, you know, and being kind of committed and, you know, knowing when to pivot. You know, you got to make tough, tough calls, but that's kind of what CEOs and, you know, management teams have to do. Yes. And it seems like that genre of virtual pets or where you're kind of <laughs> doing the care and feeding for if it's a plant or a pet or whatever, you know, that that has, I mean, that persists, oh, right? I mean, I think time. it's a very popular oh. genre. Yeah, no, it was, we knew it was going to, we, we had ideas for things, but you got to remember, we ended up selling the company in 98. 98 mm. is pretty still narrow band. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it was another four years, five years before broadband was really, really here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so you could only do so much with narrow band, mm -hmm. you know, internet. You could do some interesting things, but w being able to move, you know, graphics and, you know, kind of game mm -hmm. stuff, um, you really wanted broadband mm -hmm. you know and so we had these visions and they were just you could tell it was going to be a, a ways before we could do it mm. right you know and so that's when we decided you know we probably you know we weren't out looking to get to get bought they kind of we had a partnership with Mindscape mm. they were our distributor in Europe mm -hmm. uh, we published our own in the U.S. but they were our distributor partner in Europe and right. they saw how things were going in Europe and they figured if they're going that well in Europe they're probably doing pretty well here and so they got bought by learning company and mm. in the discussions um, 
you know, became, you know, obvious that they said, you know, you guys ought to probably, you know, we ought to, why don't you guys also get bought by these guys? And so mm. they teed it up for us to get mm. bought by them as well. Hmm. And, you know, we thought, okay, it's a good enough offer. You know, it's probably the right thing to do. Right. So. And and from there, you you went to sort of the other side of the desk in terms of entrepreneurship. Yeah, and I that's didn't get there venture immediately. Venture investing. Yeah, I didn't get there oh, immediately. Okay. I didn't get there immediately. You know, if one took a year off. I was pretty. <laughs> yeah. I took a sabbatical. Yeah. Well I, I needed to kind of you know recharge the batteries. You know, so I, I took a year off, and then and then I wasn't sure what I was going to do. Um, I wasn't sure if I was going to. Yeah, you know, I assumed I was going to go back and be a CEO, actually, because that's what you do, and I really enjoyed it. Um, but my but my wife got pregnant, uh, and she had to be under house arrest. <laughs> you know, she you know had a, a tough pregnancy. Yeah. So so I'm like, okay, I can't be CEO of a startup when she's mm. on the couch, you know, or in bed, right? Mm -hmm. So we kind of put that on, and I just became kind of a I did some you know, a little bit of angel investing, but basically I was kind of like a part-time CEO a couple places or advisor. Yeah. And I did that mm -hmm. for, cause we wanted to have a couple kids. So I figured that was gonna be at least two or three years, right? And so, um, which everything's healthy, got two <laughs> lovely daughters that are now teenagers. So that's another story. <laughs> yeah. But, um, you know, during that period, I, I could, didn't feel I could go back and be a full-time CEO. And during that period, I also, uh, did some work, um, you know, kind of helping some VCs. And, and just as luck or fate or whatever would happen, a friend of mine called me out of the blue and she was Australian and she had just joined an Australian venture firm. She hmm. goes, I'm in San Francisco, you wanna have coffee? And I'm like, okay. So I went find out what her new job was all mm -hmm. about. And it turned out I knew quite a bit about two or three of their companies. Hmm. And, you know, and the more I was talking, you know, and, and asking questions, she goes, well, you know, you could probably help these guys quite a bit. And I said, yeah, I probably could. They said, would you mind meeting with them? So I ended up meeting with the CEOs of, of two or three of their companies. And one thing led to another. They asked me if I would go on their board, <laughs> you know, and then one thing led to another. Next thing I you know, they asked if I would, you know, the, the, the firm, I met the partners of the firm and they asked me if I would, you know, come work for them. And I said, oh, I'm not a VC, but you know, for the next year, I can do it. I'll do mm -hmm. it part time for the next year. So, one thing led to another. You know, I became a VC, and you liked it. And, and I became their partner here in Silicon Valley because mm. they were in Sydney and they didn't really have, you know, a deep presence here. And mm -hmm. so I'm, a, you know, I knew a lot of people here, and so I could make, you know, connections and networks that they just didn't have. Mm -hmm. And it proved to be pretty successful for them. And so um, I ended up doing it. And, you know, first I s started just thinking I'd just do it for a year, you know, until, you know, everything was done and we had two healthy kids and <laughs> everything was settled down at the home front and then I'd go back and be a CEO. Uh, but I got intrigued enough by it, um, you know, that I agreed to to stay on. And so I ended up working with that firm for almost four years, almost five. Um, and towards the end of that five year period, myself and one of the other partners, we thought it best that we, you know, spin out and create a new firm and raise a new fund that was different, slightly different focus mm -hmm. than what that other firm had been. And uh, we created Southern Cross mm -hmm. uh, Venture Partners, which we started in 2006. And so I've been doing it for the last 11 years. Wow. And the focus yeah. is dually in Australia and it, the U.S.? Yeah. Or is it Asia and well, the it U.S.? Well, it started off, think, you know, Israel's been pretty successful as an Isra Israeli venture firm where you mm. have a presence there, a presence here. Yeah. Mm. We started off like that, except it was Australia and New Zealand. Um, office in Sydney, office here. And we would help Australian startups go global leveraging Silicon Valley. That was mm. the pure play poster child investment. What we found is there's also deals here that we had an opportunity to participate in. Um, all of them had some Australia connection, either an Australian founder or, or a technology team in Australia that we could 
connect with a team here right because people were looking to outsource development teams and we found some you know so we did some interesting combinations um but that was our first fund our second fund which really is a a and a b there's two funds but they're kind of one is we partnered with the australian government and softbank china venture capital so we now are more of an asia pack focused we have a a, 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 through SoftBank China Venture Capital, we have an office in Shanghai, we have an office still in S Sydney and here. Okay. And so we're a little more uh, pan, you know, a Asia pack focused, but Australia still is an important part of it. But now the markets are China and the US. I hmm. see. And forgive me, but SoftBank is a, is a Japanese headquartered uh, firm, and this is a, a Chinese subsidiary This is a, no, well, it started off in uh, either 99 or 2000. The first fund that they did was SoftBank China was the dominant LP in it, like 90 plus percent of the money came from SoftBank China. So they kept the, they, took on the name Salt Bank China. Hmm. It's now more n known as SBCVC, you know, which hmm. is just the letters. Yeah. Uh, they're now in Fund 5, about to do Fund 6. They're, they're the guys that did the original investment in Alibaba. Oh. Okay, so they owned at one point a third of Alibaba. <laughs> they gave them like, I don't know, 18, 20 million bucks and owned a third of Alibaba, which needless to say made them and SoftBank yeah. a lot of money. Um, you know, but since then they have done, you know, they've, they now have about $2 billion under management over, you know, five plus funds. And so, so, so it's a major but, Chinese but, but, venture firm. Correct. Okay. Uh, but SoftBank now is, SoftBank the mothership probably is 10, 15% LP in it. I don't know the exact numbers. Oh, but I see. They still are an LP, but they're not the dominant LP anymore. So Only in the first fund. Were they the dominant. Got it. And, and then from then on, they just, the, the name brand was established. Right. They were able to use the brand early on. Sure. But now, you know, it's, it's, it's less because it's SoftBank's not the, you know, the mothership's not a, the big LP like they were. They have multiple LPs from all over the world. US, right. you know, Europe, Asia, Middle East. You know, it's just a general, it's a venture fund. Mm. And are those, are those, um, sort of Chinese, successful Chinese um, uh, entrepreneurs who have turned to venture capital who, who run that outfit or? Yeah, they're, it's interesting, they're really sharp guys. Four of them uh, are, the, are the senior partners. They have yes. some junior partners as well, but they're all four, uh, they're US citizens, hmm. but they're Chinese nationals hmm. uh, that have worked in the United States for you know, 15 to 20 years before becoming VCs. Yeah. So they were all successful entrepreneurs and, you know, in the technology field. Fascinating. Uh, and they saw the opportunity to set this up with the blessing. I think SoftBank had funded two of, uh, had funded uh, a company oh. that two of them had been involved with that had been successful. Mm -hmm. And that's how they knew, uh, you know, Mr. Son at, at, at SoftBank and that's what led to those discussions <clears throat> and then they but they knew there's a real you know opportunity to go set up a venture firm in china in 2000 right just mm. as the go go is the start of their dot-com period mm. and they were able to you know timing is everything in life and they were able to ride that and you know establish themselves as a really you know they've been great partners are really sharp guys the fact that they you know english is strong they understand the United States, Silicon Valley, mm -hmm. and China. They're all fluent Chinese speaking, obviously, but it, it really makes it so that it's a, it's a good partnership. It's been easy, you know, it's been good to work with them, and they're extremely well connected there. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's, it's been a very good, you know, kind of win-win partnership for us. And it sounds it, it satisfies your long-held wish to you know, be involved oh, yeah. in, I mean, it's in why Asia I did, again. It, it's why I ended up doing, you know, the thing with Australia is because I've always wanted to do something internationally. And so being, being a venture capitalist connected to an Australian, at least to start it off with, was great. I could stay in Silicon Valley, which I still think is kind of like, how do you leave Florence during the Renaissance? <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I wanted to stay here, but I wanted to have a global view and while Australia is not the most exotic 
you know, of, you know, of global views. My sister lives in Africa. That's exotic, mm -hmm. right? Um, it, I still thought it was pretty interesting, and I still think they're a fantastic gateway into at least Southeast Asia. Sure. And now with the partnership with SoftBank, it broadens it to, to Asia Pac in general, which, you know, is, is really great. And I'm really liking that. And it's it, not only professionally is it interesting, but uh, just on a personal level, it's fascinating. Mm. Do you travel there frequently? I go to Australia a lot. I probably get to China once or twice. Always once, um, but sometimes twice a year. I get to Australia generally four or five times a year. Mm. And then around the US some but it's heavily focused there. Hmm. Uh, for a while there, I was getting to Singapore three or four times a year as well, because hmm. we had some two, two companies had major offices there, but th they're, they're no longer, we've sold those companies, so they <coughs> have less need to do that. Is your theme software for these investments or, or computing or? Yeah, we're pretty broad. We're generalized. We, we kind of have two, today we have t two focuses. One is general technology, which could be software, hardware, you know, computing. Computing could be medical device. We don't mm -hmm. do life sciences and pharma, but we can do everything else. And then we also have um, uh, a very strong interest in clean tech, actually, mm -hmm. and renewable energy. Oh, so that's great. why we have two funds. One one fund is um, funded actually by the Department of Energy of Australia. Half the money comes from their um, and called Arena, the Agency for Renewable Energy. Hmm. Uh, and it, it, it's, you know, it's our, you know, half of our money. And so okay. that has a very strong renewable energy focus, which is something we believe very strongly in. Hmm. And, um, some, and are you funding companies pursuing that sort of renewable energy technology in, in Asia? Globally, globally, yeah, meant to be. yeah. All, all of them are global. Okay, mm. all of them are global. Mm. They have they have an Australian connection, but they're all global. The Got major it. markets obviously are U.S. and China, you know, in Europe. Okay. But in the renewable energy field, China is is probably the number one market in the world, mm. and, and the U.S. is number two, mm. you know, and needs to be, right? <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, great. 